Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Mariana Siciliano, Managing Educator for Public Programs and Creative Practice at the Met. And on behalf of Heidi Holder, our Chair of Education, I am thrilled to welcome you here today to Sunday at the Met, inspiring Walt Disney. <laughs> This series is one of our long-running programs, which offers the opportunity to explore the permanent collection and special exhibitions through conversations, lectures, demonstrations, and more. Today is our first in-person Sunday at the Met back in this auditorium in the last two years. We are absolutely thrilled to see you here today. And what a better occasion to bring us here together than the subject of creativity and inspiration. We're delighted to be presenting this program today in conjunction with the exhibition, Inspiring Walt Disney, the Animation of Decorative Arts, which is on view until March 6th. For their support of the exhibition, we extend our utmost gratitude to the lead corporate sponsor, Morgan Stanley, we're also grateful to the Florence Gould Foundation, the Danny Kay and Sylvia Fine Kay Foundation, French Heritage Society, and Beatrice Stern. Further thanks is owed to the Diane W. and James E. Burke Fund, Irene Roosevelt Aiken, and Marilyn and Lawrence Friedland for making its extraordinary catalog possible. The exhibition highlights references to European visual culture in Disney animated films including nods to Baroque and Rococo revival architecture in Cinderella, medieval influences on Sleeping Beauty, and Rococo-inspired brought objects brought to life in Beauty and the Beast. The exhibition also marks the 30th anniversary of the animated theatrical release of Beauty and the Beast. Today, we have the unparalleled opportunity to hear from a panel of experts who will be discussing the making of that film and the lasting legacy of Disney films on popular culture. We are honored to have our distinguished speakers contributing to our conversation today. Glenn Keane is a 38-year veteran of Walt Disney feature animation, trained under Walt Disney's Nine Old Men. Keane created many beloved Disney characters, including Ariel, Aladdin, The Beast, Tarzan, and Rapunzel. In 2012, he departed Disney to begin Glen Keane Productions as a way to further his artistic explorations in animation, design, and film. He has since gone on to collaborate with Google, the Paris Ballet, and Kobe Bryant. Keane directed the Academy Award-winning animated short, Dear Basketball, which he animated and directed in collaboration with legends Kobe Bryant and John Williams. He recently directed Over the Moon, an animated feature musical, which was a co-production with Pearl Studio and Netflix. Don Hahn produced the classic Beauty and the Beast, the first animated film to receive a Best Picture nomination from the Motion Picture Academy. His next film, The Lion King, broke box office records all over the world to become the top grossing traditionally animated film of all time. His other films include The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, and the 2006 short, The Little Match Girl. Han has also authored three books on the art of animation, including the 2008 book, The Alchemy of Animation, which provides the definitive account of how animated films are created in the modern age. Don, unfortunately, can't be with us in person today, but thanks to modern technology and our incredible production team, we are excited he's able to join us on stage remotely. Carmenita Higginbotham is an art historian and professor of 20th century American art. She has been a featured consultant on documentaries with PBS and CNN. And she has appeared in the Washington Post and on CNBC about the Disney Corporation and its cultural influence. She's also a published author on 1930s American art and racial representation during the Depression era. Higginbotham currently serves as the Dean of Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts in Richmond, Virginia. Their conversation will be moderated by Wolf Burchard, Associate Curator in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Met and Curator of the exhibition. 
To begin our program, Wolf will begin with a brief presentation looking at Beauty and the Beast and its historic roots. Please join me in welcoming Wolf to the stage. Thank you, Mariana, so much for this great introduction and welcome, everyone. Um, so my name is, is Wolf Burchard, and I'm the um, curator of Inspiring Walt Disney, the animation of French decorative arts. And, you know, what an incredibly exciting way of, uh, of, of, of closing an exhibition as, as we're drawing to a, to a closure than to have a, uh, an, an in-person event with so many uh, friendly faces. Now, what... Um, I thought I might do, as I'm introducing the panel, is to give you a bit of an overview of how this rather unusual um, project came to be, the genesis of this project. Um, this exhibition brings together two worlds that may at first seem miles apart. On the one hand, we have Walt Disney hand-drawn animation that was created in the 20th century for a broad international audience. And on the other, we have 18th century European decorative arts made for the tiniest European elite. And yet, when we are bringing those two realms into a dialogue, we will identify great, very many areas of overlap if we think of their source of inspiration, their artistic intuition, rhetoric, humor, craftsmanship, workshop practices, and indeed advances each pushed in design and technology. You might also go as far as saying that actually they have, even in the 21st century, two different audience. On the one hand, you may have a sort of rather um, traditional connoisseurial audience that is interested in uh, porcelain and antique furniture, um, and on the other, you have the Disney fan. And what is so wonderful when you go through the exhibition is seeing that you can't really make a distinction between these two audiences. It's just one audience. And what I think is so heartening for me and for those worked, working on this exhibition is that every single person going through the exhibition seems to be spending as much time looking at the Disney drawings as they are looking at the 18th century decorative works of art. However, the reason why I wanted to bring up, you know, the fact that there are potentially two different audiences is how do you explain to, I mean, I know that there's very many animation fans in this room, but how do you explain to a non-animation person who, for instance, Glenn Keane is? Well, um, I had this great pleasure uh, about two summers ago when I started working on the exhibition catalog to interview Glenn via Zoom. And, you know, as I'm a terrible name dropper and wanted to show off to my family, um, my cousin, Jan Philipp Schwarz, who's also in the animation world, uh, was, was visiting. And so I was showing off to him and said, you know, I've just been in a Zoom meeting with Glenn Keane. So he was obviously very impressed. But two of my sisters were there and they just didn't know what I was talking about. And I was, who is, who is Glenn Keane? And so my cousin, to illustrate the magnitude of the event, said to them, you see, Glenn Keane is the George Clooney of the animation world. <laughs> and um, although I'm not sure that it's the way you want to be described, I, this really remains so much in the back of my head that I thought, you know, whenever I'm trying to explain to someone who Glenn Keane is, he's the George Clooney of the animation world. Now, this is so wonderful to have this, this opportunity um, to, to have this panel. And I, I must admit that um, Glenn sat at the very beginning of the genesis of this exhibition. Five years ago, I was having dinner with uh, two friends of mine, um, Alison Gowdy and Bridget Preussen, who were both historians of, the 18th, of 18th century art. We were having dinner before Christmas, and I got talking about Walt Disney and Disney animation and very specific scenes, and I was st starting to talk about Glenn Keane's work and talking about the amazing perspectives, the, the, uh, the foreshortening, the flapping of Mar Hooter's huge wings in The Rescuers Down Under, the twirling of The Little Mermaid with a camera from above, of course, the transformation of the beast, and, of course, you know, Tarzan, who's jumping and skating across um, various trees with, with extraordinary anatomical accuracy. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't stop talking, as you can, can tell once you get me going, talking about the subject. And they, at some point, said, Wolf, you know, you should do a Disney exhibition. I said, well, no. And so I started thinking about this exhibition. And really, one point that I wanted to make, and um, this might make my 
my boss, Sarah Lawrence, laugh, because the one point that I always want to make and banged on about is what I wanted to do is open people's eyes to the incredible draftsmanship that lies behind the making of these films. And that is evoked in the exhibition with this wall. You need 24 drawings for one second of animation. We show this here with this wall devoted to the transformation of Cinderella's dress. And you can see there's sort of one lighter box where we have a screen where you can actually see the full animation. But the full animation is not 24 drawings, it's actually 18 seconds. So imagine a wall that would be 18 times the size of this wall's to accommodate all those drawings. And on top of that, it's actually twice as many drawings because you have two drawings that are overlapped. On the one, you have Mark Davis's transformation of the actual dress, and then George Rowley's cascade of sparkle, each placed with absolute precision. Now, what I think is amazing about this is not necessarily that it is mind-blowingly laborious, the fact that they had to pore over each drawing for hours, and that all of these are then transferred, each individually on a cell, etc. but the draftsmanship that lies behind this, and these are artists who trained on the job. There was no formal training for these artists, but they were pushing a new form of artistic expression to its very, very limits, and that is exactly what the Rococo decorative artists did in the 18th century. So what this exhibition does is not only to say, here's the original source of inspiration, this is what the Disney animators did with it, but also going back to the original context in which stories like Beauty and the Beast, for instance, were written. So Beauty and the Beast was first published in 1740 by Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve, in, um, and it was written at a time when there was a whole fashion for stories told from the perspective of inanimate objects. In fact, in 1742, so two years after the publication of Beauty and the Beast, um, uh, uh, Crébillon, Monsieur de Crébillon, who actually was kind of her stepson, published a book called The Sofa, A Moral Tale, which is a fairy tale of a man turned into a sofa who can only be turned back into a human being if he is the witness or the stage set, if you will, of a true declaration of love. So that's one way of animating an inanimate object. Then here we have um, Missonnier's great icon of the Rococo, which is an abstract sculpture, if you will, um, the gilt bronze candlestick on the left. And what we're evoking here is not that this candlestick has informed the appearance of Lumiere, but showing how two different artists, so Missonnier on the left and Kevin Lima on the right, separated by two centuries, are trying to bring an object to life. And, and Missonnier does that by creating one of the first abstract sculpture by combining all these um, S curves and C curves and undulation and thereby carrying our eye across this complicated um, design surface. And then, of course, uh, Falconet, who designed, uh, the, the great sculptor Falconet, who designed the Sèvres Tower vases, which are the centerpiece of the last room of the exhibition. And here again, we're not trying to suggest that the Disney animators or the architects who worked on either the, the, the castles in the Disney films or in the theme parks were directly inspired by this, although it is at the Huntington Pasadena, which one, was one of the go-to museums for, for Disney animators, but rather to suggest that 200 centuries earlier, artists were is using a similar kind of visual language to encourage our imagination. Um, Falconet, the, the sculptor who designed this, this vase, um, is, is most famous for uh, his medicine cupid, of which you can see here, oops, sorry, of which you can see here, it makes a cameo appearance in Fragonard's The Swing. And Fragonard's The Swing makes a cameo appearance in Frozen in 2013. And that cameo appearance actually sits at the end of a long tradition of Disney animators um, engaging with that particular composition. And they started in 1989 when working on Beauty and the Beast, of which you can see here the, whoops, don't do it. Um, so illiterate with when it comes to technology. Um, and you can see here the first storyboard um, that was produced in 1989. And this is where our story begins. This is where I would ask Glenn and Carmenita to join me on the stage and hopefully Don as well um, in form of a screen. Right. Don, can you hear us all right? Can he? Yes. Can you hear us all right, Don? Okay, good, 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 good. I haven't seen that. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much, the three of you, to, to join us. And um, I thought we might start by um, asking you, Carmenita, about your first 
Disney experience and if you remember watching your first Disney film? Okay, that is an extremely difficult question. Not only will I date myself if I do that. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> reveal my age. No, I think, I think uh, as with most of us, our Disney moment, our Disney experience is a collection of opportunities and interactions that we had with Disney and what we saw on television. I will say that um, significant to me was not simply seeing the films, uh, but rather the ways in which the films entered my world. So I received the Cinderella music book uh, with the record, back in the days when we had records, um, and I would play the record and look at the book at the same time, which had the animation and the drawings from the film, which I was only able to see periodically when it was re-released either in, in the theater, which was rare, or on television with the wonderful world of Disney. So unlike audiences today where we can queue up anything from the vault whenever we want, um, it was that touchstone of being able to have the daily mm -hmm. interaction with the music and the pictures that was critical. And I would listen to the music and I would look at, and Cinderella is still my favorite. Still my number one favorite <laughs> Disney film. And, and so, so there wasn't sort of one light bulb moment where you said, this is, this is my key moment. Do you, was there a light bulb moment where you thought, I now want to intellectually engage with this and I want to devote some of my scholarship to this? Uh, there was, there was. Um, and I think it was mostly about a cultural transformation that was going on in academia and within art history. And so right about 2009, 2008, I had the opportunity to begin teaching on Disney with the understanding that uh, there was there was space within art history, there were conversations that were taking place culturally that um, audiences had an appetite for that, to really understand that there was a critical framework for engaging with Disney. It wasn't simply, did you love it or did you hate it? It wasn't, were you simply a fan? But rather, there were a variety of aesthetic um, and theoretical you know, sort of pathways into Disney. And so, I bit the bullet and I taught a class and wouldn't you know it, 19 year olds want to take a Disney class in college. <laughs> surprise, um, surprise. And, and they thought it was just gonna be watching movies and singing songs, they really wanted to do that. Um, and I had to pull them back from the edge and read a considerable amount of other material. Some were disappointed, but, at, but I think at the end of the day, the, the richness of that conversation in terms of pulling in cultural study and uh, art history, particularly um, art practice and art making uh, media, it all came together. Great. Um, Don, I was, I'm, I'm not even sure where to look to talk to Don, but, um, and I think it's so wonderful that we have you here on the screen because I know that you take a particular interest in Tomorrowland, and I think it's great that, you know, you make the sort of almost sort of 1960s sci-fi appearance here with us on the stage. Do, um, <laughs> uh, tell me, what, do you have a light bulb first Disney moment where you thought, this is what I want to do. I want to work for Disney. I want to do uh, hand-drawn animated films. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, Don, we can't, can you unmute or, I don't know if. Just uh, <laughs> yell louder, Don. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't know if the... Can you, uh, can we give it another go? No, we... No. So while this is getting fixed, why don't I ask Glenn um, <laughs> what... Um, I'm not trying to <laughs> leave you out, Don. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, Don. <laughs> um, I'm sure we can, I'm sure they'll fix it. Um, so, but in the meantime, since our time is precious, Glenn, would you tell us whether you had a light bulb moment and you thought, this is what I want to do? Yeah, well, for me, it was my birthday. Um, I guess it was 1961, because that's when 101 Dalmatians came out. Is that right, John? Yeah. Um, and <laughs> our family, there was seven of us, and we all went in our station wagon to the drive-in movie theater, which is, I highly recommend. This is the best premium experience for enjoying sound and visuals 
the tinny little box that was sitting on the edge of the, the windows and squeezed between my brother and my sister, my other brothers in the front. The windows fogged. It was <laughs> popcorn ma magical. smears everywhere. Magical. It was magical. <laughs> but I got to say, when Cruella de Vil came out, uh, she was the most horrifying. I mean, I just pictured our little Labrador, you know, in her hands. And I mean, I was so frightened of this evil woman. I mean, it, it was such a testament to the animation of uh, storytelling of that team that that film became so real to me. Um, I didn't even think that anybody drew it. I mean, that, the idea that they weren't real never even occurred to me. Now, are we, do we have Don back on, or? I don't, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, can we turn it off, on and off again, or something? Um, <laughs> I don't know if our team on our side can do anything. Because what I, so my next question, which would have been to Don, and then it, maybe Glenn can jump in while we're, we're hoping that Don can jump back in. No, we can't hear him. Well, I can't hear him anymore. Okay, I can't. So I think they'll, they'll probably trying to fix that still in the background. So let's, uh, let's um, we, we, we need to start talking about Beauty and the Beast and the making of Beauty and the Beast. So Glenn, can you take us back to the year, to the summer of 1989 and the making of Beauty and the Beast? This was your first trip to Europe which is a wonderful echo to Walt Disney coming to Europe for the first time in 1918 and then again 1935. Can you tell us about that experience, coming to London in 1989 and starting to work on this? Yeah, uh, well, I wish Don was there talking because yeah. Don had such a big part in all of that. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Don. Um, Don has a magical way of taking whatever life throws at you and turning it around for something wonderful. So somehow it's going to work out. I'm just confident with Don. Um, and that's part of the whole story of Beauty and the Beast was some of the challenges we had. But I, when I look back on that time, I'd never been to Europe. And I was given the chance to actually go to uh, France when I, was, when I graduated high school. Um, but I thought, I don't speak French. That's weird. What am I going to do there? I'd, can you just give me the money? And so I got the money, and I bought the, the car that my folks would have given me anyway, which was a 65 Mustang. I spent $500. I bought that car. Um, and years later, it was like, what an idiot. I could have gone and experienced it all. And then Beauty and the Beast came up, and um, Don asked me to do the character of the Beast. And I was like, yeah, I want to do this. And then management had said, yes, but we, and we want you to go to London to do it. Um, and I said, well, this is really cool. Um, just me? And they said, yeah, just you. What about my family? No, just you. Don didn't say that. It was somebody else. Um, <laughs> so I went home, and I told my wife that, you know, they, they want me to go to London to do The Beast. And uh, she said, oh, that's so, going to be so exciting for all of us to go. Yeah, well, it's just me. <laughs> and she said, you said no, right? I said, yeah, I did. I said, no, I can't go without my family. And so then I, I went back the next day, and um, Disney said, well, we're going to send you and your whole family there. And that changed our life uh, because, Don, can you talk yet? No, doggone it. Go, just move your mouth. I have one belly now. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, that's not working. <laughs> so, so, so that's how you got to London. That's how we got to and London. Then you, and then you started working on this storyboard as a group. 
Um, and uh, and the, originally the story was going to be firmly set in the 18th century. You took inspiration from the swing for the opening sequence. Um, and then Jeffrey Katzenberg and the leadership of the animation studio said, yeah, and there's nothing much happening in your storyboard. You know, we'll start from scratch. Everybody come back to Los Angeles. But you all got to go to the Loire Valley. And Don organized the trip. Um, and incidentally, I'm just going to, since he now can't respond, I'm just going to say that I did actually suggest to him over the phone two years ago that <laughs> I would, um, that we should all go. I would love to recreate that trip and just take the whole group of people to go back to the Loire Valley. Yeah, he can't respond. So, so he gave me the whole itinerary, and you did an amazing trip. Of, over the course of three days, you visited basically every important chateau across the Loire Valley. And could you say, it would be lovely if you could speak about what impact it had on you and how you, because you really take on the personality of the, of the characters you're animating, right? So can you tell us about the experience of driving to Chambord and I don't know, at 5 a.m. or whenever it was. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, it was, uh, when, when Don came back after this fateful meeting where Jeffrey threw out everything that we'd been working on, Je Don, in his wonderful way, <laughs> you can move your mouth and pretend it's you talking, Don. Um, he said, <laughs> I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Um, what do you want to hear first? We said, well, the bad news. I said, okay, well, everything you've been working on this summer in London is thrown out. What's the good news? The good news is we don't have to do anything right now, and we're here. Let's go for a research trip to France. And I was like, yeah. So that, that's what we did. We all went there, and... Um, I remember we stayed in the town of Blois, wasn't it, Don? That was, I think that's where we, and the next morning we were going to go to, <laughs> um, to see Chambord. And Don and I, they didn't have room, so actually Don and I shared a bed, which is probably... Um, <laughs> <laughs> We all, we all did that, our group. I mean, no, Jean Gilmore didn't. She had her own room. <laughs> but I, I remember one of, coming down in the morning and <laughs> Hans Bacher, who was you know, sharing a room with someone else, and he said, I had no idea the human body could make that many sounds. <laughs> Anyway, so we got, it was really dark, and we were driving through the forest um, of Chambord, the King's Forest. And in my mind, this was Belle approaching the castle. I hadn't seen it yet. And it was foggy, really foggy. So the trees were just monolithic, dark shadows as you're moving through it, and then the fog, the trees cleared, and there was a clearing, and just a wall, a dark wall of this enormous castle with spires, and I was like, oh, this is Beast's castle. No matter what the design is, this is the feeling it has to have. It had an ominous, dark, hidden presence. I'll, I'll never forget that. Um. It looked like you wanted to react to that and want to say something. No. Yeah. Well, no. It's just it's just in incredible to have that sensation, and then and the ways in which you're able to translate that into sort of an aesthetic experience. You know how you want it to feel, how you think it should feel, and then the impact it has on your creation of your of the character, right? And did, yeah. so, did that view, that sensation, that that ominous feeling, did that immediately impact how you structured? Um, the beast, I mean, that sensation right there was, was sharp for you. It, it, was, it was real. I mean, it was real. Uh, in animation, if, if you don't believe in what you're doing, no one else will. I mean, I've, I've always felt like the, the secret to animation is make believe. <laughs> you can make, as a kid, you make yourself believe. Somewhere along the way, we lose that ability 
to just invent a, a real world. And as we were all jammed into the <laughs> two cars, approaching that, it was, it was palpable. And it was in London and then in France that I, I really started to think of myself not as an animator, but as an artist. Um, my dad, when I was little, I said, Glenn, I'm a cartoonist, you're an artist. And he gave me a book on uh, figure drawing and anatomy. And, and it was at that time that I started keeping a sketchbook and just drawing what was going on around me and the people and the experience of going there. And uh, I think that I've got some and sketches. We have from that. some sketches here that you, um, that you drew in the, um, at the Loire Valley. Yeah, this is, this is us sitting on the edge of the Loire. And it was like, I didn't know animation could be like this. Yeah. That we're just out there in the world sketching. I remember, Don, you came up behind me, just standing there as I was drawing this. And we were both just really quiet. And this is, this is Azel Rideau, I think. Yeah. And, just, and you said, isn't this wonderful? I was like, yeah. You just had to whisper. It was this <laughs> Villandry, yes. the gardens of Villandry. It, it, was, it was a whole new world for me. And I, so I was, I was reminding myself I'm an artist first who will find some way of taking everything that I love about art and put it. Well, Carmen, we were talking earlier about. Oh, is it Don is, is on? on? No. Oh. <laughs> Did we think? Was there? He was there for a second. For a moment. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Okay. Can, can you give it one more go? Maybe it is the headphones. Folks are voting, you take your headphones out. <laughs> this, we've all lived this. This is, this is the last two years of our lives, this. <laughs> so we'll, we'll still hope that they might fix it on our end. The only thing is that now the, this microphone is sounding funny, isn't it? Now you've got an echo. Um, all right, well, just while they're still continuing to fix this, we'll, we'll move on at the Loire Valley because there's some um, further influences you may want to talk. There's Don, there's a, there's Don. there you portrayed silent, him. Silent as always. Um, silent as always. And then, of course, um, we were looking at this yesterday, the Burgers of Calais, which inspired the transformation of the beast. And it's so wonderful that here at the Met and Petrie Court, we have a cast. Could you talk about that? Yeah, well, so Don was our producer, um, was an artist as well. So it's wonderful to have a producer who really understands the heart of an artist. And, you know, and this is the time that we're born. We see ourselves every bit the artist that somebody in the Renaissance would have seen themselves. It's just our art form. Our cathedrals we're building are, are not made out of stones. They're made out of one drawing 24 frames a second on top of each other. And at, I knew that for me, the high point of this movie for me was Beast's transformation. Um, and I, I just thought about it the whole time. To me, it was very much an expression of just my own spiritual life. Um, the idea of transforming from the inside out, I was like, I can't wait to do that. Finally, the time came. It was at the very end of the movie, I only had one week left 
to do all this thing that I felt like I was born to do, and oh gosh, I was so frustrated. Somehow, Don heard about my anxiety, and every time, I don't know how I was expressing it. It could have been shooting ham sandwiches with the, uh, the slingshot we had across the, <laughs> <laughs> the team. Nobody appreciated that. But um, Don came in and said, Glenn, I hear you're, you're really frustrated. Um, I just want to tell you, this is a very important moment. You need to make it everything it can be. You need to take the time, whatever time you need, um, I will clear it somehow in our schedule. Do not worry about that. Take the time. Thank you, Don. Because, you know, moments like that are, are gifts. So I wasn't going to waste it. So what did I do? I got up and left work. <laughs> <laughs> and I drove down this freeway in Pasadena and went to the Norton Simon. I thought, I, I've got to connect with other artists. I think the people that I've learned from, I've learned from the dead guys, the dead women, those artists that came before me. And as I walk towards the Norton Simon, first thing you see is the Burgers of Calais. I was just there a couple weeks ago, and took this picture, um, and it's downstairs, or it's, where is it? It's here yeah, somewhere. In Petri, in Petri Court. So. <laughs> We'll have an opportunity to see it afterwards. What an emotional sculpture. I mean, the story of these burgers that um, the king was going to destroy this town. And he said, the only way that I will let you live if you, the leaders of the town come and sacrifice themselves to give themselves up. And that's what this sculpture is. These men walking out, knowing that they're going to die. And Calais asked Rodin to m immortalize this. Fortunately, the king's wife was so moved by this action, she said, you cannot execute these men. Um, and so they lived, and Rodin created this sculpture. So uh, anyway, as I was walking around this, um, deeply moved by this, there was something that hit me the back, which I think there's another, is there another there is. sculpture? Yeah. <laughs> I came around the back side, I was looking at the canyon of the back mm -hmm. that Rodin sculpted. It wasn't just a flat back, it was, it was strong and powerful and, and I just did drawings and drawings. I just started to draw this and, and I only got part way around this, and I, I just shut my book. I said, I have to get back to work. I, kn I know what I have to do. Um, and you and, did. And I did. So this is the beast's transformation from the I back. You start to see him, him turning and then turning into the prince. Um, oops. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> turning into the dwarves. Very with, good uh, transition. The directors didn't we'll like that. that. Don said, no, no, you can't turn it into the dwarves. <laughs> and well, since we were going, we, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Um, would you like to, because there's, there's, you know, talking about France, I mean, you've, you've repeatedly emphasized what an important uh, influence French art had on you. I mean, this, of course, is a, is a 20th century sculpture, but also 18th century painting, the work of Boucher. Um, would you be able to, to, to talk about that a little bit? Well, as Carmen Eden and I were talking about art schools, and um, for me, my art school was Disney, really. Um, and and you would you would hit a wall as an artist where you're so frustrated, and you just everything you're doing you hate. Mm -hmm. And I would get up, and I would walk the hallways, and then Walt had a library of books that he collected when he went to Europe, and. Um, with some of which are in the, in the exhibition. Yeah, and I would wander around in there and just grab books and uh, grab one, and there was a drawing of Francois Boucher's. And I was like, this j looks just like 
Freddie Moore's drawings, who taught all the animators, and this was the drawing. And so I, I started seeing the French curve in it, and so I did uh, these drawings, click back a couple times, back and forth, and it was this rhythm in this, in, in Boucher's work, and I realized that Freddie Moore was, had the legacy from Rococo and passed it off to Disney, and that this was, the, he does, this guy Freddie Moore, a young animator, 20 years old, de designed all the dwarves and the look of Disney, but it was really rooted in the style. And, hey, Don, um, can you try to talk now? Oop. Hello. Oh, right. Oh, perfect. Yay! Thank you, everyone. It's been great being with you today. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Well, we're, we're thrilled we can hear you, and I'm so sorry about the technical hiccups. Um, now, I, if, I, if I'm, since we've got you on the phone, so I, I might like to make a, a sort of quick jump as we're talking about the making of Beauty and the Beast and the reception of Beauty and the Beast, but also um, the fact that, you know, this is a collaborative effort. There's all these people working together, all these different personalities working together, and, and Don, you're sort of leading the team, all these different personalities, but also the, the setbacks. I mean, this is, this is one thing that I think is, when you, when you look at these objects also, the decorative objects that are the product of, of large groups of people working together, um, you, one, one aspect of the film that is, is as important as the animation, I think, is the music and the lyrics, and you've produced two wonderful uh, documentaries, both about the Disney Renaissance and about Howard Ashman who produced the lyrics for the, for the film, um, but who died six months before the release of the film, uh, died of AIDS. And, and could you talk, because you, 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 you captured it so beautifully in your documentaries, what impact that had on all of you, sort of on a personal level, as you're in the midst of producing a film like that, that one key figure suddenly disappears, as it were, in such a tragic manner? Well, Howard was much more than just a lyricist. He was um, a dramatist, a coach, a educator to all of us. And um, by his work on Little Mermaid, uh, we were just kind of tuned back into the power of American musical theater. And so to see him get sick during the AIDS crisis and slowly lose his life was really um, devastating and yet he kept working on the film and some of the most vibrant lively songs in aladdin or beauty and the beast were written when he was in the hospital so uh, it's again a tribute to the power of the arts to kind of rejuvenate us and bring us life even under difficult circumstances um so yeah it was tough for us but um we knew we had to keep going and we had these great songs by Howard and Allen that were like these tent poles that would hold up the movie uh, dramatically. And, uh, and if we could just connect the dots with a great story, great animation, we'd have something. And it's, I mean, the, the power of that music and the lyrics is extraordinary. I mean, you know, when I walk through the exhibition and we have at the end, we have this sort of on a perpetual loop and then you have the chorus, Beauty and the Beast. And when you look around, I mean, I know everybody's wearing masks now, but you can see definitely that various visitors get sort of rather teary eyes. Um, that, the, the ballroom scene, the, the, the great moment in the, in the film is I think one to which the, um, the shortlisting for best picture is, is to be attributed to this amazing moment in film history where you have this incredible uh, uh, combination of hand-drawn animation and computer animation. And I think, and we, Glenn and I were looking at it yesterday, I mean, the amazing thing is really that you have that incredible collaboration because to think how the animators producing the, the, the characters had to imagine the three-dimensional space, and it really is one of the first three-dimensional spaces produced in, in CGI. Don, could you, could you talk a little bit about the, the production of that incredible scene, which, you know, in a sort of Disney tradition, people didn't know whether the, you know, the, the audience was going to buy it or not. Yeah, we didn't know if we could buy it or not. Um, Walt Disney was all over technology. <clears throat> and any time he could use technology um, at its cutting edge, he would. Uh, and so that was a real tradition in the studio. And so one of the things that we um, wanted to do was create this 
this soaring kind of romantic atmosphere when they dance in the ballroom. And uh, Kirk and Gary, our directors, um, and Roger Allers, who later went on to direct Lion King, um, came up with this beautiful kind of soaring ballroom. And it's five years before Pixar. <clears throat> so one of the things that we had was um, we had to render the ballroom one frame at a time. And we would set up these render farms on the weekends and um, come back on Monday morning and maybe two frames had rendered. Um, we didn't have a lot of computing power, but <clears throat> when it did render, it was breathtaking. And, um, and, and so we, we had a backup plan, which we called the Ice Capades plan, which is we would just simply turn the ballroom off and have Belle and the Beast dancing in a beautiful spotlight of light. Luckily, we didn't have to use that, and we could just use the entire ballroom in all of its glory. And it, it was a real um, fresh start for animation. Um, it, it seems uh, almost incidental now in the age of the brilliant computer graphics movies we see, uh, but at the time, it was a real leap forward. Um, and, and thanks to the team, because animation is a real team sport, um, we were able to put that moment on the screen. I think it really captured the audience. Well, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, it certainly, um, it certainly did. And I think there's something, and it actually goes back to the lyrics of the, of the song, there's something bittersweet about that scene because on the one hand, you know, it's a, it's a great, great masterpiece, but it also heralded the rise of, of computer animation, which ultimately meant that hand-drawn animation gradually disappeared, and, um, or at least isn't as present as it used to be in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, Glenn, what do you um, what do you think is the future of hand drawn animation? Well, it's funny. I I just did a hand drawn or a CG film over the moon. Um, I drew more for that movie than I did for The Little Mermaid. Uh, you everything springs from drawing. Um, I have a clip here of me doing drawovers for the CG film of Tangled. Um, and you can just see how much drawing actually goes in. The animators, what they would do is um, they'd show their work in what we call dailies, which is a little theater, and everybody would um, uh, sit there and they would watch the animation, and the animators would sweat, and then it's called a sweat box. And, but you would do quick little drawings to show them what you wanted it to look like. And my friend John Cars had his camera next there who was filming me doing this. I'm trying to see if we can get that piece of animation because it's not on oh. this one here. But in the okay. meantime, and again, we're sort of, I'm afraid we're sort of slightly running out of time and I've got so, so many other questions that I would want to ask you. Um, I mean, I think as we are sort of having to draw this to a close, um, well, there's two things. The, the one thing, Glenn, if, if we can, relatively quickly, uh, is ask you, because the, the one point that you made time and again about the making of your characters is that they reside inside of you and that um, you just have to find them on the page. And that was also true of The Beast, which I think is such an incredible uh, piece of design because it looks so natural when actually you had absolutely nothing to work with. I mean, the fact of the matter is that both the two original 18th century sources, the two original versions of Beauty and the Beast hardly describe the beast. And then the, the, the stories of the 19th century, the fairy, it's, you know, it's a boar, it's a bear, it's a lion. Um, but you create an incredible creature. Do you want to revisit with us on the page how you actually, how, how you met the beast? Yeah, so I, mean, I have this weird belief and now I'm not sure how the audience is going to see that. The camera's on. Oh, there it is. Oh, good. That was easy. Oh, yeah, there it is. This is the best part. <laughs> okay, right. So I, ha I have this weird belief that the characters that you animate exist before you start to design them. Um, and I would have never said that, except that that has been my experience. And like with the Beast, Don Hahn had uh, bought uh, a big buffalo head that I'd asked for. I, I, I went to it. a taxidermist in Burbank that week and I bought a buffalo head 
And uh, the only problem was when I returned my expense report in and it said one buffalo head. <laughs> so I had that on my wall as well as other animal photos and uh, a wild boar as well. And um, my assistant came in and said, so what's the beast going to look like? And I'd been drawing him for a long time. And nothing looked like it was created like an animal of the animal kingdom. It all felt like aliens or something. So I, my assistant was standing behind me, and I said, well, I don't know what he's going to look like, but I, I kind of like this buffalo head on the wall. It, there's sort of a, a sadness to the shape of a buffalo head. Maybe it's because he was on my wall. I don't know. <laughs> but... And I like the crest of a gorilla's head. There's these big muscles that come down for it to chew bamboo that, make, that go up high up into the cranium. And the gorilla brow, beast has to be very expressive. So he's got to have these really strong, powerful animal brow, but at the same time that you could see the emotions that have to be the beast. Um, and I love this wild boar bridge to his nose, the hair going back and, and then the tusks coming up with like the boar. But then the beard, the buffalo has this beard there and uh, but he had to be soft too. So like what if Bell held him? He, and my assistant is standing behind me, and I, this is exactly what I'm saying to him. I say, there should be these, the mane of a lion around on the side. But then as I'm, you know, uh, that's right, and there's a body of a bear. Like, you can see some of just the, the massive bear-like body in this cape. These horns that are kind of a combination of a whole bunch of different horns of different animals that I've been drawing. Then I thought, Bell's not going to fall in love with this. <laughs> this, <laughs> this isn't going to work. I'll soften him. I'll give him cow ears like that. <laughs> but inside, you know, the said that the eyes are the window to the soul, and I said inside there is a prince trapped. And as I was drawing the eyes of the beast, I could see this prince looking out from inside the body, like wanting to be freed from this. And I said, that's him. He's going to look. That's him. There he is. And it was that quick. So amazing. And, and that's been true on all the characters that I've done. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing with us and revisiting with us this um, amazing, uh, this amazing moment of, of creativity because it is, it is extraordinary how, you know, you have created all these characters that have shaped the, the childhood of a, of a global audience. Now, I'm afraid we have to draw this to a close, and I um, wanted to ask Carmenita, we've now been, you know, had the privilege, you and I, to talk to two, you know, important um, artists of the 20th century, and what do you think, this is a bit of a big question, um, <laughs> what do you think, um, or what, to what might we attribute the universal success of the Disney Renaissance, which Don and, and Glenn have, have formed or shaped in such significant ways? Well, I, th I think definitely this connection to artistry that was never lost from the Disney Corporation. Many of us like to think of Disney as simply this industrial complex that controls the mediascape and has for, you know, almost 100 years. But rather, what we're seeing, and just in Glenn's conversation, it's been absolutely wonderful to hear you and watch you. 
um, just create just the beast on the page and hearing your thoughts about it. Um, that connection to looking back at, and not, not copying, but realizing the aesthetic um, series of conversations that take place within the language that you adopt, the, the influences that you have, that you are, and Don, you as well, true artists who, who, who appreciate the emotional and communicative power of what it is you do. It is quite extraordinary. Thank you, Carmenita. I think this, um, this uh, was a wonderful summary of, um, of today's panel. I think we could easily continue talking for another hour or two or three. I certainly would be very happy to, but I think I'll get into trouble uh, with the people in charge. So thank you all three so, so, so very much for joining us. Don, thank you so much for your persistence, Thanks, your patience. Thank you, Wolf. And, and Wolf, I have to say thanks to you for all you've put into this exhibition. You know, this is the first exhibit of Walt Disney and his studio art at the Met, and it's exquisite. And so I thank you personally and uh, the Met for hosting us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Don. Thanks so, so much. And thank, thank you all for coming.